The, um, I, I let him run a little bit on that cutoff low. You, you shouldn't let him get off that easy. The cutoff low is what gives some of us gray hairs over the years. You know, you come to Sandy Hook and you're heading for Cape May, and all the forecasts look like it's going to be going southwest to west, and it doesn't happen for two days. The thing is just sort of sitting there backing around. One of the things that you'll see all through these is the general assumption is that weather moves west to east. And a lot of the models have that built in. If you throw things like that hurricane that went the wrong way, or some of these cutoff lows in, it can really cause a problem with the models. So cutoff low is very important to us. Lee is going to be around uh, to answer questions, and you can warm yourself up for later in the afternoon. Okay. I'm here to represent the other two-thirds of the equation. That is the ocean. 70% of the globe is covered by water. Um, you've heard, I hope you've heard, how important water vapor is in all of this. You'll hear more about it right now, but we try to leave students walking out the door sort of feeling for water vapor because it gives you a pretty good inroad insight into what the weather might be. The ocean circulates. The atmosphere circulates. They're both fluids. The only difference is density. A matter of 1,000 times more dense water than air. And compressibility. Air tends to be compressible. Water, not much compressible. But the fundamental equations of motion are exactly the same. And we play some games with friction. The ocean tends to move at five to six knots. And you saw that the atmosphere might move at a couple of hundred knots, depending where you are. Uh, so you have some relative scales differences. But the, the fundamental characteristics of the systems are exactly the same. You saw this earlier. Another one that I want to impress you with. We're dealing with a couple system here. Ocean atmosphere, atmosphere ocean, both influencing each other. We're pushing water around, we're pushing air around over the surface of a rotating sphere. Important. You want to sit around, we could have some fun playing games with Coriolis, we do in class. Right? Uh, there's an equation up there. It says the Coriolis force is two times the Earth's rotation times the sine of the latitude times the speed of the flow. You heard Ken talk about the faster the flow, the higher the Coriolis force. And you also heard that in many areas of the ocean and atmosphere, flows are the result of a simple balance between pressure force and Coriolis. We like to assume that. It gets less and less true as we get into areas with more and more friction, as in shallow water. But a lot of oceanography started in deep water, and a lot of meteorology tried to stay away from the frictional effects, as you saw. And so we tend to treat flows as simply Earth-turned, geostrophic. Simply earth turned. But it's an assumption. The primary factor is governing ocean circulation. We can't give you the whole oceanography course in 45 minutes, so we're going to buzz through this pretty quick again. Uh, water column density, changes in the density of the water column. You've been hearing about changes in the density of air, right? Warm air, cold air, more dense, less dense, higher or lower pressure because of changes in temperature. The tides. You all should be, to some extent, expert in the tides uh, and winds. So here we go, real quick. Water column density. The density of the water, ocean water, is a simple function of temperature, salinity, and pressure. I just told you a minute ago that the water is fundamentally incompressible, so you can believe that pressure is in much in effect. But if I take it down to 35,000 feet or so, 
I can get some squeeze. There are some pressure effects. They're subtle. For the most part, the density we care about near surface is governed by temperature and salinity. The distributions of water temperature and salinity result in spatial gradients in water column pressures, which is exactly what you've been talking about in the air, right? Differences in air column density causes differences in air column pressure, which causes uh, flows in the air columns, knee winds. So here we have the same sort of thing in the water column, the ocean currents. Okay, very simple. All of this stuff is simple. Okay? Most of us live our life in and around estuaries. We got the river coming out here, the Susquehanna top of the top of the Chesapeake, the Hudson, the Connecticut, the Merrimack, we're all East Coast boys. I think there's a river or two on the West Coast. We get up, take you up to the, U to the Yukon. Um, you got fresh water flowing out over salt water. You got fresh water, less dense water moving over salt water. You tend to get some mix between the two and some circulation. And you'll see some impressive pictures like this guy after Irene. Here's the Connecticut River. Here's our home back here. Um, and we got the Connecticut River coming out, and Irene was a rainfall event, so you get a nice tracer, a little bit of mud in the water for you to see out. But you get an idea that that water stays pretty much near surface. In fact, that layer of muddy water is only a couple of meters thick, over an average depth of 30 meters in Long Island Sound. Um, and you can see that it's moving out, too, in here. Um, the river is, and the river outflows are probably the only real velocity situations that you are we are going to have to be worrying about. The typical density-driven velocities when we're deep water are on the order of centimeters a second. Now, that's not much in terms of navigation, but it can be a lot in terms of mass transport, heat, and the like. So it's important in, in, in many portions of the ecosystem, not much important to us. We do care about, though, when we tend to come into the Susquehanna, we care about stream flows. We go up to Delaware, coming, in, coming into the, to the Chesapeake Bay, and you worry about stream flows, carrying logs. You can get a couple of knots of flow from a stream flow. And this, all this guy is telling you is that there can be significant variations. Here we are in August and September of 2011, and you had 100,000 cubic feet per second over something like 3,000, 4,000 cubic feet per second average. So you can, you can see some major stream flow events. You want to keep an eye on stream flows when you're coming in. This is just tells you that there's a seasonality in the, in the temperature salinity field offshore New York. This is a section off uh, uh, New Jersey. And the stream, the, uh, the, the, the flow velocity is generally on the order of 20 centimeters a second or so. It affects the transport of stuff from the shelf up into the river and vice versa. So density, don't generally have to worry about it as a sailor. Tide's different story. Important, the tide is a wave that's produced by the gravitational interaction of the Earth, Sun, and the Moon. It's a wave. You know waves, they wet your feet on the beach, eh? Ubiquitous, waves are everywhere. All sorts of physical phenomena display wave-like characteristics. We've seen long and short of it in the 500 millibar plots that Lee just showed you. So remember that because you know a lot about how waves behave, whether you believe it or not. You'll see as we go along. This is the qualitative wave spectrum. It just shows you where the waves that, that are produced by the gravitational interaction, Earth, Sun, and the Moon, stand in terms of characteristic periods, 12 hours to 24 hours. Again, you know that. Most places around here have a dominant diurnal tide, right? So two highs, two lows a day, kind of a thing. So 24 periods. Wave period, 12 hours to 24 hours for the tides. And this is, these are the capillary waves. That's the cat's paws. You know, in the morning when you come down, no wind, and you start looking whether you're going to go sailing, you start seeing some cat's paws on the water. They're restoring forces, the capillary action of the near surface, and they have very high frequency. And these are the, the wind waves that you know about. From one second to about 30 seconds, the characteristic waves on a beach, slop, slop, slop three to six seconds or so in period. Okay, we'll see that period is important to us as we go along. Um, you'll see this again and again. We'll see this again in a moment. 
uh, when we start talking about wave dynamics, but here is just a beginning wave dynamic. You know what happens as a wave moves near shore. Remembering that wavelength is a simple function of the period. So in terms of feet, 5.12 t squared. You take 24 hours, that's in seconds, by the way. You take 24 hours and turn it into seconds and square it. You can believe you get a great big number. And then multiply it by five, you get an even bigger number, okay? So you can believe that if the wave begins to feel bottom at a point where wa the water depth is about equal to one half the wavelength, that the tidal wave is affecting the whole of the water column. The average depth of the world ocean is about four kilometers, 4,000 meters, okay? So you can sit there with your pen and paper over lunch and you can figure out what the wavelength of a tidal wave is, but you can believe it's long compared to the depth of the ocean. Okay, as it comes in, as the wave comes in, it's feeling bottom. Feeling bottom means it feels friction more and more as you're getting in closer, and it's gonna tend to shoal. Shoaling is a process where the wave tends to shorten and the wedge tends to get steeper. You know that also. If you're a surfer, you're very familiar with it, okay? The tidal wave behaves just like your beach wave. Most of you saw this way back when as the instructional for the way the tide is produced by the effect of the moon pulling on the water, the gravitational interaction, that's the G. The moon has much more of an effect than the sun because of its separation, okay? The sun is too far away to really give us much of an effect. It gives us a finite effect, but the tide for the most part is dominated by the moon. So the gravitational interaction of the moon tends to produce a bulge on the near side and the combination of the two spinning around each other, you get a centrifugal reaction on the far side. Isn't that a nice simple picture? Okay, this, this is a rotating earth, and so you sit there and you watch this rotating earth moving under this lumpy kind of thing, and the moon's moving around, and, think, and you get a very nice pattern over the course of a month. Here's the sun, okay, there's the moon, okay, and here are your lumps, you with me? Okay and you're gonna see them varying over the course of the month. You're gonna find when you're in the quarters, the moon's over in here, you get the neap tide. Less of an effect because they're in quadrature, okay? When, you, when they're in line, the new moon and the full moon, you'll get a spring tide. Spring does not refer to March 21st, okay? In this case, it tends to, to refer to the orbital characteristics of the Earth, Sun, and the Moon. So that in the ideal, you'll see over the course of a month for the principal semi-diurnal tide, you'll see something like this. You get two tides a day going along like this, and you'll get during the spring period significantly greater range than during the neap period. Clear? Very simple. However, early in the game I told you that the tidal wave is pretty long, meaning that it's affecting the whole of the water column pretty much over the whole of the Earth, meaning that as that Earth rotates, it's gonna to tend to drag some water along with it. So the positioning of the lump is not gonna stay right where you like to have it. It's gonna be dragged along. So the equilibrium tide is a nice beginning to talk about tidal characteristics, but it's inaccurate from a physical standpoint. The real system is what we call the amphidromic system, and here, I like to liken this to the, to the gods are sitting up there throwing rocks in the puddle, okay? Now you've all, I live on a dirt road and we have kids dropping rocks in our puddle. We got lots of big puddles, okay? And so here's, here's Thor dropping his rock in the North Atlantic puddle, okay? You see him? Plash. And there's a wave that's moving around this amphidromic point, okay? The rock in there. In open water, that wave is going around pretty much uninhibited. But that wave bumps up against the edge of the continental shelf. And along the East Coast continental shelf, because the East Coast continental shelf is significantly shallower than the deep basin, you're gonna find a refraction in the wave front. The time of the tide along the edge of the shelf is about the same, all the way down. That pulse then, that wave moves inshore into the mouth of Long Island Sound, Narragansett Bay, Buzzards Bay, Mass Bay, and the uh, Bay of Fundy, okay? 
And in those basins, each one of those basins is going to react differently, affecting the propagation of the tide because of its dimensions, its length and depth. So you get significant spatial variability in tidal characteristics, how that wave, if you will, that wave, as opposed to those waves, uh, shoal, refract as it moves into the basin. So when you get up to Fundy, you get a 16-meter tide range kind of a thing, max. Uh, pretty impressive, the top end. The low end of Fundy doesn't show anything like that kind of a range because what you're looking at is a neat resonance because of the length of the basin that's affecting the propagation of the wave as it moves up the basin. Now we see something of the same thing in Long Island Sound. Tidal range on the east end of the sound is about three quarters of a meter, two and a half feet or so. You get down towards, uh, beyond Stanford and, and down towards the East River, it's nine feet, three meters. So there's some shoaling that goes on in all those basins. Not as great as this, but still that. Okay, so it's, and these are the, now the, 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 the tidal plots. They don't look as neat and as, as, the, as the ideal. This is a real one from New London, okay? And the blue guy is the predicted, and the yellow guy is the real. And you can see that you go along, and there's a fairly neat variation, spring neap, that you can see in this. But you also see some extremes pounding along. The tide can be influenced, the tidal characteristic can be influenced by uh, short period meteorological events, wind stress. And the best example around us was our friend Sandy. Okay? And so here's your tide running along here, some, something on the order of two to four to two to three feet, and here you're sitting at eight, nine feet, sitting up on top. I can't quite read. That says eight up in there, I believe. Okay, about eight, about eight feet. So you can get significant perturbations in the tide due to meteorological events, short term. We typically see on the order of a foot to two feet of variation in tidal range every year. On occasion, you'll see a major event like this guy, which might have about a 25 to 40 year uh, return frequency. Okay? Um, speeds. You can get significant speeds. Here we have over three knots coming out of the Bay of Fundy. Okay? and two and a half knots or so going back up into the Bay of Fundy. And I could show you the same thing in Long Island Sound. You have less in Chesapeake, although there's more currents down towards the mouth of the Chesapeake than there is the top end of the Chesapeake. But just again, a lot of the game we play here is in scaling. It's important for you to know how big something is relatively, how small something is relatively. So scale is important in our game. The, um, you want to note the spatial variability in these trajectory patterns. And remember that tidal flows tend to be elliptical. That means they're not linear. It means they show a pattern, they trace out. If you put a particle in the water here and let it be carried by the tidal flow going in and tidal flow coming out, it wouldn't be a straight line. It would be tracing out an ellipse. Now, you see that. We often see it racing the mouth of Long Island Sound we can watch the lobster buoys to see how we're being set. We're trying to reach up and get a Lee Bao effect going in. That's because the flows are not rectilinear, not simply back and forth. They tend to be elliptical in pattern, and they tend to display some significant spatial variability. Okay. We want to be on time for lunch. This is a long story, and this is really where it all is. The, the winds have a major effect on the ocean, and the ocean has a major effect on wind. It drives circulation. The rule of thumb is something. You blow some wind over the water, you get about a 3% coupling. 3% coupling, what the hell? You give me 30 knots of wind, I'll get you pretty near a knot of surface flow, okay? 0.9. Got it? So it's just like I can blow the head off a glass of beer here. I blow some wind over water, you get some direct drag on the water coming along. So there are some direct wind effects. And it gener they generate surface waves, and surface waves can, in the, in the, in, in the, on their own part, generate some amount of transport and flow. Uh, real quick, real quick, you know all about this. This is the typical atmospheric temperature profile getting cooler as you get up to the top of the troposphere, somewhere around 250 millibars, 
okay? Uh, 50, 60,000 feet kind of thing up in the air, uh, and then getting a little bit warmer as you go further out. What we care about is down here, most of the weather we care about occurs in the troposphere, and we're working up into a general gradient of cooler as we go up. The problem in, in meteorology and atmospheric circulation is, a, is driven by the fact that there is a latitudinal variation in the amount of heat coming in and the amount of heat going out. We tend to be gaining heat at the equator, losing heat at the poles. If you didn't move some heat from the equator to the poles, the equator would continue to get hot and the poles would continue to get colder, and we would be uncomfortable. We tolerate a very limited thermal range, some more than others, some people more than others. Okay? So, here's a quickie. The atmospheric engine is driven, run by, in the first instance, incoming solar radiation. About 50% of the incoming bounces off the clouds, about 50% makes it to the surface, warms up the water, warms up the land. Okay? You're now warming up the aquarium in your room. You see it? You got a, 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 a hair dryer sitting on one end of the aquarium and you're warming it up. You can believe that if you did that, you can generate some circulation in the aquarium. You can generate some circulation in the aquarium right here. Now the question is, how do you enhance that circulation? Well, you're warming up the water and there's some turbulent exchange of heat, direct thermal. This is warmer than the air. You'll have some heat exchange and you'll have some exchange of moisture. And we've been through this latent heat transport now, and at least, no, I think it's all of the talks have covered that to some extent. The fuel tank, water, moisture, is a very important component that tends to drive the atmospheric heat engine. Okay? Warm, moist air is the fuel. And the exchange of heat due to the change in state the movement of that air is an important component of everything we've been talking about. Gradients produce the winds. Winds tend to roughen up the surface, which enhances the exchange of heat and moisture. You've all had the salty windshields on the car in the morning when you leave it on the beach, next to the beach too long. Okay? You got waves and currents. Okay. And that's where we're playing, right in here. You've seen this before, the general circulation of the atmosphere. Okay, the general circulation of the atmosphere in the northern, northern hemisphere has something like a gyre, clockwise, Pacific, clockwise, South Pacific, South Atlantic. Okay? Again, an ideal picture. We've sailed on some of these waters and looked a long time for that northeast trade or the southwest go. Okay? But in general, over the long haul, we can generate a series of surface currents, and I've circled up the warm ones, the Gulf Stream you know about, okay, Brazil, Agalis, East Australian, and the, the, the Kuroshio, the black current, the equivalent, the Japanese equivalent of the Gulf Stream. We're only going to look at Gulf Stream real quick. So the winds blowing over the North Atlantic tend to favor the production of a clockwise circulation that's characterized by a marked westward intensification. The Gulf Stream system is much stronger and narrower than the, than the Canary Current side. Okay? And why? We had Lee doing a dance, we had Ken doing a dance, and they were both talking about vorticity. Remember, you're pushing fluid columns up over the surface of a rotating sphere, and one of the laws of nature, that started coming back from our friend Newton, is the conservation of vorticity. That's why you change your rate of rotation when you change your radius of gyration. Okay? The skater pulling in here, going, you're conserving energy, and there's very little energy being lost on those skinny skates down there. We've got to do the same sort of thing on the water columns. Henry Stommel in, the, in 57 was the one that pointed it out and made an argument about why the, why the westward intensification. So we can talk about more about that later. Um, the wind blowing over the water tends to favor the production of a bit of a mound in the middle of the Sargasso Sea. We all know we sail uphill when we go down to Bermuda, and here's proof of it. Okay, the, 
the elevation difference is about one meter across the Gulf Stream. So you got about a meter change in elevation in 100 kilometers of Gulf Stream, okay? And the wind blowing, we start to bring in now temperature and salinity. We also have associated with that wind drag a spatial variation in temperature and salinity, fairly sharp. So you can expect some flow associated with that, just like we expect some flow. Now out here, because of the combination, the current speeds are going to be significantly greater, okay? We're running, we're running something like 13 centigrade out in here, and we're something like 24 centigrade when we start going on down, 22, 24, 24 here. Fairly sharp temperature gradient, fairly sharp salinity gradient. You can believe there's a fairly sharp density gradient there. The Gulf Stream is the result of a combination of wind and density differences producing this intense westward current. It's the current, that's the boundary between cold shelf water, cold R water right here, and warm Sargasso seawater. You're going out on it. The best way to find the Gulf Stream is with a thermometer. And yourself, <laughs> remember? You can, the moisture. The flow is turbulent. This is a snapshot, highly recommended. Google it, get it, get it. Perpetual ocean, go take a look at it. It gives you a fine representation of the nature of your dance partner. This is the result of a model that's been run by NASA, and it's run over a couple of years, and you get an idea of the rate of change of these systems over the course of a month. And it's real, it's slow, but it's real. The other thing you get a sense of is here is your Gulf Stream current, pretty much straight and parallel, almost laminar along that Carolina shelf until you get up to the vicinity of Hatteras where it goes offshore and it looks like the downstream of the old time days when we had cigarettes. All right? They're nice and meandering. But you also have the number of eddies in the interior of the flow. Now, wouldn't you like to be able to do the same thing in the atmosphere? Well, there are some pictures of the atmosphere that show the same thing. It gives you a sense of what you're trying to predict. Remind you now, uh, I can't put a spot small enough to, for your boat. And I don't care how big your boat is, Lloyd. That, uh, that it, it, the, the, the boat is buried in this detail here, sort of thing. So here is, uh, in my, in my, on my slide, it's a beautiful picture of the Gulf Stream. And on yours, it's a little washed out. This is a sea surface temperature image. Sea surface temperature image. Uh, from the Rutgers site, it gives you an idea of what the main body of the Gulf Stream looks like. That's coming along here. There's a nice looking meander, okay, down in here. And there's some features, the rings that are shed off here. So here's the main body of the stream. This is sea sur surface temperature. This is a composite image taken on February 16, 2006, okay? You can go to the Rutgers site and you can go rummage up your current pictures of the stream and see what they look like. We've set up temperatures, and, a, and for every temperature, we, we assign a color. That's all that is. All right. Important. Again, scale. Important. I told you that the density currents are typically on the order of uh, centimeters a second. Okay? I told you that, I showed you that the currents and the tidal flows, maybe in the fundi, maybe in the mouth of, of Long Island Sound, maybe two or three knots, four knots kind of thing. Okay? Here we're coming into the Gulf Stream, and we're taking some measurements, doing some measurements with instruments, doing some measurements with measuring density, and we get an idea as we start marching in here, the current starts to pick up. We see this, this is based on temperature going in, so here I say I see this jump in temperature, so I call that my zero. And I start walking in, and I find velocities, speeds, on the order of 25 centimeters a second. And everybody knows what that means in terms of knots, all right? All your kids do anymore now, anyway. 50 centimeters a second, one knot. 50 centimeters a second, one knot, okay? You'll see a lot of plots in terms of centimeters a second, so it's well to hang on to that. You start marching in, and you find yourself, when you get about 30 miles into the stream, there's a lot of temperature activity going on, you'll come to a max on the, on the order of 250 centimeters a second. About five knots, about five knots. 
And measurements over the years showed it to be relatively constant. It's plus or minus maybe a half a knot. So this, the, the stories of seven knot currents in the stream are a bit apocryphal, unless you give me a hurricane. Remember the 30 knots giving me another knot or so. So you give me 60 knots, I can find myself another couple of knots and pile it on top of this. But there's probably a few other things you're worried about besides set and drift at that point. Um, just real quick on this, the meanders tend to have an, have an evolutionary pattern. So do these rings that are cut off. This is a warm core ring, so I also see warm core ring. They can be 150 to 300 kilometers in size, discrete patches of warm water. And they might march into the Gulf of Maine. 100 kilometers is 60 miles, OK? 180 miles across. That's a big patch of warm water with a three-knot current in it. Core currents out in here can be on the order of three knots. Okay? The whole, same, these features tend to drift to the west at about a tenth of a knot, and they burn themselves out on the bottom. So they don't last much longer than a month or two. But in that month, they can have some interesting effects on ecology in the Gulf of Maine. The cold core rings, same sort of thing. It's cut off to the south of the stream. We can talk about the problems in, in finding them. Same basic kind of structure, drifting off towards Hatteras as well. But these guys are much longer lived because they're in deeper water. So the stream. Variability. There is a regular ship, transit ship going down to Bermuda. This was Oleander uh, riding an acoustic Doppler current profiler, which allows us to measure currents at different, water, at different depths in the water column. And here's the surface pattern going down. You can see it comes down. There's New York. There's Bermuda. And here is the surface pattern. And you can see there's a scale down in here. It doesn't get out to quite 250 on that. But it's sort of a splayed kind of a thing. The other thing to remember about the Gulf Stream is that it is filamentous. It's filamentous. It's not a solid wall of water coming at you. So you might be one side or the other of the filament and see significant differences in speeds. Very, uh, the rule of thumb is if you find yourself three knots of current, be satisfied, take it and go with it. Don't go looking for the five knots. You might spend a lot of time looking around for it. But I only show you this because here is going down and here is coming back. The shift that can occur in about a week or less than a week. So you go down, have your good time down there, dark and stormy, turn around and come back and find a very different stream structure. All right. Important, warm water currents are often weather breeders. You come down to the stream, you're sailing from Newport down to, down to Bermuda, and very often you'll see a street of clouds sitting out there as you're coming down on the stream. That's that rising wet water, condensing and sometimes producing thunderstorms and the rest. Okay? Uh, everybody's seen lots of these guys, so here we go. One, rapidly intensifying, developing hurricane force. It's, uh, the area of influence is about 1,200 nautical miles across this thing. The speed of advance was 35 knots. 35 knots in 1,000 miles, it means it's going to be around for a little while. You might have to lay two for quite a while to let this guy go walking by you. And it's pretty much clear where you don't want to be. Why the intensification? Remember the role of water vapor in rising air. Okay? You're just putting gasoline on the fire. Think of it. It's the fuel that's firing that, the, the atmospheric heat engine. Okay, here's 40 north. Here's 40 north. Okay, that's the Navy pattern of the Gulf Stream. There's your Gulf Stream, right on 40 north. So that storm rode right up the core of the stream. Okay. Uh, this reminds me of, uh, if we all tell me sea stories, it says, cold air outbreaks drive extremely active convection over the, over the region of the stream in the 1998 race. In the 1998 race, we were at the awards ceremony. A fellow came up and handed me a note from Ken Campbell. And it said something like, do not be in the Gulf Stream on Tuesday. And of course, standing around me, and nothing but fellows that were going to be in the Gulf Stream on Tuesday. You know, <laughs> because they all had, quote, schedules to make back, back home. And we were one of them. Um, it was a very interesting event when a, a fairly sharp cold front came marching down across the Gulf Stream. And you heard, you should now be able to figure out all of that because you heard all of the reasons why from Ken this morning. The enhanced uplift because of the wedge of cold air coming in, 
Add to that the fire of the war rising warm air already, and you've got a perfect storm condition. Okay? Remember, the same can occur anywhere that has, you have a nice warm water thing. Over that warm water ring in the Gulf of Maine, you can get some interesting local phenomena. Waves. Up here, a picture. Ready? This is wave length. Trough to trough. This is the period. Could be trough to trough, but I'm just drawing crest to crest. Wave period, clear. And wave height is from the trough to the crest. You sometimes hear about amplitude. Okay? We're going to be talking, you've been talking a lot about heights. So it's from the base and up. The size, height, and length of waves depends on wind speed and direction, duration, and fetch, the overwater distance. Fetch. The result is a variety of waves of different lengths and heights. Important. You're dealing with a spectrum. It's not a single wavelength. You know that. You're out there. But we so often forget that. Why is it important? Those different waves have different wavelengths. Those different wavelengths feel bottom in different water depths. You can be sailing along merrily off the Farallon Islands off California and watching waves come in, bumpity, 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 bump, and breaking well inshore of you. And all of a sudden, you look offshore, and there's a wave breaking. And you find yourself in embarrassing circumstances up on the island. An extra long wave came along in the, in the assemblage, in the spectrum. It felt bottom sooner, it shoaled sooner, and it broke sooner. So it's important to realize when we're playing with ocean waves, we're playing with a spectrum. Uh, chaotic seas in the area inside the fetch. So where that ring, the low is sitting in the middle and all that wind around it, that's the fetch area. Long Island Sound is, is geographically limited. Open ocean, limited by the size of the system. Okay? When we get outside, these are the seas in the fetch area, we run into swells. Um, again, back to my rock in the puddle, and you may have seen this. There's a splash when the rock goes in, and you produce a spectrum. And if you watch carefully, you'll see that spectrum separate itself. And it separates itself by, in, in, into a dispersive pattern due to wave length. You see, in deep water, the waves aren't feeling bottom, and the speed of the wave is a simple function of wave length. So the longer waves go faster and they separate out into swell. Got it? We used to use swell as a way to determine storm characteristics, the location of the storm, the strength of the storm, before the days of the satellites and all the rest, and the observational networks. Okay? So in deep water, you're going to see a separation between the short wavelength guys, high frequency, and the long wavelength guys, low frequency. We come inshore, come inshore. This is the pattern you saw before. Don't need to go back through it again. In here, the velocity of the wave is a function of water depth. So as, once you start feeling bottom, this L over 2, the speed of advance is a simple function of water depth, which can significantly affect the patterns they refract due to water depth. And, of course, the characteristics of the wave. It's shoaling, it's steepening, and the like. We'll see more of that. Uh, just some data, a color picture from the Ocean Prediction Center, caught up a couple of days ago. Um, you can see the, the, the heights of the waves, six feet, I'm running like that. These are all significant wave heights. When you look at these patterns in general, unless you see something to the contrary, you're looking at significant wave height. The significant wave height is the average height of the one-third highest waves. Okay, that's significant wave height. That's not maximum wave height. Okay? Um, I put this one on. This is the forecast, uh, again from OPC, but I put this one on because it gives you some indication of Gulf Stream location. And we'll see there may be significant interactions between winds, winds, waves, and local currents. Okay? Um, and, and we can get it in black and white. Here's the stream again. Okay. Um, I happen to like uh, Environment Canada's presentations. Uh, there's a couple of things on this. All this work, both OPC and Environment Canada's model data, model data, 
And the, uh, the, the, this, this one is particularly nice because it gives you, over in here, you can see on any one of these, you'll get four numbers. This is the wave period, the wave height. This is the swell uh, period and swell height. And if you look at these, you can see there are circumstances, not surprisingly, where the wind-driven wave is at cross purposes, right angles or close angles, to the wind waves. So you, depending on what you're looking at, it might be important to consider wind waves and swell. Okay? And you can get that on the Environment Canada's part. This just gives you an idea of the differences between the, uh, the wave heights. Okay? This, this is significant wave height and, and, and maximum wave height for, for one of our stations in Long Island Sound, Storm Sandy. And you can see this is significant wave height. Okay, runs here. And the max wave height is not quite twice, but it's significantly more than the significant wave height. Important, most of us care about the maximum wave height. So when you're planning, you're adding a, well, be safe side, add a factor of two, the significant wave height. This is the most important piece that you have here. This tells you what happens to waves when we run wind against the current. This is a plot from Bill Van Dord's book. It's still in print. Um, and I've split, here you have a plot that's split by this line right here. On this side, it's winds against the current. And on this side, it's winds with the current. I picked off a typical wave period, ocean wave period of 10 seconds, and a maximum velocity of five knots, which you can all agree to. That's what we saw in the stream. That's what we saw in the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. Ah, call me a liar, three knots, five knots, okay? Um, if you take a look at that, there are two plots on here. One is height with and without, and one is wave length with and without. Okay? Let's take a look at the heights. Here's our one half. It's about in here, my red line. You can see that the wave height might go to a factor of twice as high to as much as five times as high. Holy Christmas, that's really piling it up. How about the wave length? The wavelength can be cut in half. So you shorten the whole thing up, and you steepen the whole thing up. And it, again, any boys that have been playing in the Gulf Stream a few times, there are times when you think you're going in a brickyard. You know, just keep banging into these bloody things. There's no great wavelength to them. That's the problem. It was the problem in FastNet, and it's the problem everywhere. You want to avoid breaking waves. It tends to throw you a little bit, as it's showing you here. The breaking condition is h over l is 1 over 7, where l is a simple function of period. You saw it before, 5.122t squared. Okay. So I come out here and I take a look at my plot. This is another sea surface temperature. And I stuck on some easterly winds, just for the hell of it. And I said, we can pick off these areas, this area, and this area here. It's going to be areas of steep to breaking seas, and over here, less severe. So depending on what you're trying to do, you can do your routing based on a knowledge of what wind against the current can do to you. That's what you don't want to have happen. And he actually did come back up. Some of you may have seen this. We can tell you, show you the book. I don't have time to talk about this today, but we can talk about it at the, uh, at the round table. This is here to tell you that there are rogue waves. Rogue waves have been thought to exist for a long time, but they were treated as a bit of being a bit apocryphal, as in the seven knot Gulfstream currents. Okay? Here's a set of data from, a, from an oil rig in the North Sea that shows you're going along, running five meter waves in here, and all of a sudden you find something like a 17 meter wave. That can really ruin your lunch um, and, on, and do a lot of damage, and has done a lot of damage to oil rigs out there. Well, the, 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 the beauty of what we're doing today is we're getting better and better observations that GO16 was mentioned earlier, um, and we got more buoys and we've got more platforms out there taking good data, and there are now a fair number of studies to show that th these waves occur, and they occur on a frequency that's not zero. It, but it is like 404 million, you know, a uh, hundredth of a percent. But of course, if the hundredth of a percent is you, uh, y you, you care. Uh, we don't have, it's beyond the state of the art right now, to uh, give you uh, primary conditions preceding that are likely to lead to rogue waves, other than major storms. 
and you're saying, which you're trying to stay out of anyway. But the rogue wave does exist. Okay, so here we are. We're dealing with a couple system in which the ocean influences the atmosphere and the atmosphere influences the ocean. Ocean currents are driven by a combination of winds, tides, uh, spatial water column density, latter being the least. And the relative importance in these are going to vary from place to place. Uh, sea state, uh, you know about. It's often a function of the extent to which ocean currents and local winds interact or don't. Uh, sea surface temperature, a very important and useful parameter to measure, to add to your kit. So a barometer and a thermometer is sort of the basic piece of, infra of, of gear that you're carrying. Air temperature and water temperature are important to us. Um, and we'd like to get, get looking at the accuracy of model-based predictions. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>